Australian True Crime is a proudly independent podcast produced by us with no corporate or network overlords policing our content. Unfortunately, that means we get none of their cash either. If ongoing payments aren't for you, you can now make a one-off contribution of any amount you wish simply by clicking the link in the show notes. You'll know which one. Hello, Australian True Crime listeners. I'd love to tell you that I'm constantly running out of food at home because I'm a busy working mum with no time to shop. But I think it's actually because I'm just really bad at admin. And it doesn't even really matter why it is. All that matters is that I do have to feed these children and pets and I need milk for my coffee. Luckily, I found DoorDash and they bring you snacks and drinks and household essentials like to your house in under 45 minutes. So I don't have to stop editing podcasts or drive to the shops or even put on pants. They bring cleaning supplies, pet food, even everything I need from the reject shop. And right now, our listeners, that's you, can get $10 off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $20 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code OZTRUECRIME. That's A-U-Z, by the way, OZTRUECRIME, all one word. $10 off and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code OZTRUECRIME. One more time, A-U-Z, true crime, for $10 off your first order with DoorDash. God bless those people. The producers of this podcast recognise the traditional owners of the land on which it's recorded. They pay respect to the Aboriginal elders past, present and those emerging. The following podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature and is not suitable for children. To make matters worse, we had quite serious police corruption Police were, in many cases, in armed robbery squads, for example, they were in on the take. They were involved in armed robberies or green lighting armed robberies. We now know this from some of the police that were arrested and prosecuted for this. There was a time in Australia where crime was hectic. Armed robberies, a racket in stolen goods like stereos that could be sold quickly an explosion in the heroin trade, and shocking gun crimes, including at Hoddle Street in Melbourne, Strathfield Plaza in Sydney, and Port Arthur in Tasmania. The shooting spree that's shattered dozens of lives, grief and anger tonight, as a nation searches for answers to the slaughter. In 1991, 33-year-old Wade Franken spent just 10 minutes murdering innocent people as they shopped at Strathfield Plaza. Armed with over 100 rounds of ammunition and a knife, he killed seven people before turning the gun on himself. Melbourne police have charged a 19-year-old former Duntroon cadet with the murder of one of the six people gunned down on the streets of Clifton Hill last night. Another 18 people were injured in the shooting spree, which lasted about 40 minutes. Even former Prime Minister, the late Bob Hawke and his family, were directly touched by the impacts of the drug trade when he and his then-wife Hazel spoke to the nation about their daughter's heroin addiction. You don't cease to be a father like any father. I, I love my daughter. I trust her. By 2000, Australia had the highest rate of burglary, the highest rate of assault, sexual assault and robbery, and the second highest rate of motor vehicle theft among 25 countries included in an international crime victim survey. These were including the United States, the UK and parts of Europe. But then something happened. Researchers Don Weatherburn and Sarah Rahman explored the downward trend in crimes that's become their book, The Vanishing Criminal. I chatted to Don, who knows a lot about crime stuff, having been the director of the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics for 30 years and is now a professor at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. When I started work in the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research, every time I had to hold a press conference about crime, crime was going up. So from 1988 onwards, I thought crime was always going to go up. And, uh, you know, I dealt with police ministers and other ministers and They all seemed depressed about the fact that crime never seemed to go down. And then suddenly in 2000, 2001, it started to go down. And at first, no one believed it. 
But 20 years later, here we are, and it's gone down dramatically. And I thought to myself, well, what an interesting story. You know, I wonder why it's done all this. So my colleague Sarah and I put some work into it and um, found a really interesting puzzle. Now, you mentioned that you were the director of the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics. Can you tell me a bit about who you are, Don, and what you've done in your working life? So I, my first really interesting job was as director of the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. And the Bureau's job is to track crime trends and see what's happening in the criminal justice system and report to the public. So if you want to know what's happening to crime in your area or you want to know what's happening to crime across the state or across the country, you can ring up the Bureau of Crime Statistics and find out what's happening. So my job, and it was a great job, uh, was to actually run that organisation with 30 hardworking people. And we would sit there every day trying to understand what had happened to crime and, and why it had happened. So uh, as I say, I spent the best part of 30 happy years doing that. And then sooner or later, I had to grow up and do something else. So now I'm having as much fun at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre looking at drugs and alcohol. So from your time that you started at the Bureau of Crime Statistics to when you finished, you mentioned that crime has gone down and we'll explore that. But when you first started, what was crime like, particularly in New South Wales where you focused on, but Australia broadly? Well, Australia generally was in the middle of a serious crime problem. I mean, we had, many of your listeners might remember, we had armed robberies nearly every second day. We had people's houses being broken into. About one in 20 households were being broken into every year. One in 50 cars were being stolen. We had endless problems with bank robberies and 7-Eleven robberies. And, you know, it was just a major problem. Crime was always in the news and there never seemed to be any let up. And that's the way it went from the mid-70s right through to 2000. And it was the number one issue most people were concerned about. They weren't worried about global warming. They weren't worried about the economy. They were worried about crime with good reason because, you know, it was a serious problem. The first chapter really does detail that time from around 1984 to the horrible event of Port Arthur. But, you know, there's some really serious crime in there. There's, as you said, the bank robberies. There were the incidents in, in Melbourne, the Queen Street massacre, Hoddle Street. You detail the crime in 1984 in New South Wales where an armed robber basically shot a cop who actually survived. But can you talk a bit more to that particular period? You know, it just seemed to be a lot of bad crime. I was growing up, I was sort of probably from about seven years old to my late teens during that time. And, and I recall those awful crimes like Anita Cobby, Janine Balding, all those, those ones that we get a lot of our listeners still ask us about. So can you talk a bit to that? Sure. Well, I mean, I like you, I was pretty young at the time. And I guess the, the turning point for me or the thing that really shocked me was that case where a young fella held up a bank in the CBD can you believe it, was surrounded by police. They must have known it was going to happen or they were on the spot quickly. And so he got a bunch of people out of the bank and put himself in the middle of them and marched out to a car so that they couldn't shoot him. Otherwise, they'd hit one of the hostages that he'd taken. He got in that car, he was a Datsun, and they drove all the way through the city, over the bridge, down to the Spit Bridge. And the police had raised the bridge so that nobody could get across. And so the car had to stop. And a young police officer went over to try to reason with this guy. And the guy immediately shot him and was then shot dead himself. And that was shocking enough. But And it was all on television. But the thing that really got me is that after that, we had so many similar horrific incidents. We had the Strathfield Massacre. We had the Hoddle Street Massacre. We ended up with fella in the Northern Territory driving a truck into a pub and killing lots of people. We had the Port Arthur Massacre. We had judges being bombed, bombs outside police stations. People these days find it hard to believe this, but it was a pretty terrible time. And there are incidents like this going on all the time. And it wasn't just incidental stories that I'm telling you now of incidents. If you look at the stats, the stats were terrible too. You know, between 1974 and 1999, the crime rates just kept going up. It was a terrible time, I think. And these days, people who didn't live through that can hardly imagine what it was like. What did you attribute or what did the statistics and the, the stuff that you knew that police were dealing with, why were they those crimes during that time? Were you able to pinpoint any factors? Sure, we were. I mean, there are a whole bunch of factors at work in the rising crime. The first one was 
we had a huge problem with the heroin epidemic. We had vast numbers of people dependent on heroin in Cabramatta and Redfern and King's Cross and in other states as well. And these people, many of them, were resorting to crime to fund their purchases of heroin. So the heroin epidemic, I mean, we had a prime minister's daughter who was addicted to heroin. And that was a, a big push. But we also had, in those days, you might remember, an abundance of high-value consumer goods in the lounge room. So people had stereos and colour televisions and all sorts of things that were highly valuable and easy to sell. And another thing we had was very poor vehicle and household security. It was so easy to hotwire a car and steal it. And most people didn't have electronic security in their houses. To make matters worse, we had quite serious police corruption. Police were, in many cases, in armed robbery squads, for example, they were in on the take. They were involved in armed robberies or green lighting armed robberies. We now know this from some of the police that were arrested and prosecuted for this. And if that wasn't enough, we had plenty of cash in circulation. So people would be walking around with wallets full of cash, whereas now they're walking around with bits of plastic that they can put over a screener and and pay for their goods that way. So there are a lot of things that were helping to make crime a lucrative activity for people. What was the police response to the crime at the time? What was their way of trying to stem the tide of it and deal with the public's reaction? Because as you said, the public were pretty up in arms about it. Well, look, the police who were honest and trying to do a decent job were not very sophisticated in their approach. So, for example, they had an armed robbery squad, they had a fraud squad, they had a motor vehicle theft squad, they had all these different squads, one different squad for each different kind of crime. And they would basically set about catching crooks. They didn't do much prevention work. They weren't smart enough or they didn't know enough to do the prevention work that would have stopped this. So they were basically chasing an ever-larger number of thieves, most of whom didn't have prior criminal records, so they couldn't be identified. And it was a hopeless task for them. They weren't well supported by management and they weren't accountable. So, you know, for example, these days, every local area command has to explain what they're doing to reduce crime and the uh, hierarchy come back every three months or four months to see how they're going dealing with it. Well, that wasn't going on then. What would happen is the police commissioner would put out statistics about a year late saying what a great job they'd done and that was it. And so we'll go back to, I want to touch on the police corruption aspect because our listeners know that there was definitely a problem in New South Wales and, and in other states. So you're saying that that definitely had a part in the crime rate, in the way that we detected it, or it just got allowed to happen? That's right. I mean, especially in crimes such as gambling, robbery, organised crime, there were people quite clearly who were just letting crime occur and or taking the proceeds of crime off criminals for their own personal enrichment. And that sort of thing basically sends two messages. Firstly, it sends a message to criminals that it's okay so long as you don't get caught. And if you do get caught, do a deal with the cops and you'll get away with it. The second thing is it sends the young officers who had just joined the police. Well, this is the way it works. You know, we don't try to prevent crime. We just get smart about getting a hold of crooks and and getting money off them. It used to be called the joke. That was the standard term for the way in which police operations worked in those days. What the police didn't understand, or if they did, they ignored, was that organised crime was primarily responsible for the drug trafficking and for the receipt of stolen goods. So if you stole a video or you stole a, something of value, you could sell it to crooked pawnbrokers who would, would be in league with drug dealers who would buy it. So, you know, basically had a situation where because organised crime flourished, the stolen goods market flourished and the drug market flourished. Without any effort to control that, you were never going to get burglary down or motor vehicle theft down or all the other kinds of crime down. I I often think about this when I watch, you know, television shows or old movies about, you know, that what they call that golden age of armed robbery, really, in Australia. We've we've touched on this before in the podcast when we've spoken to some authors who talk about some of the really high profile armed robberies and also the fact that many of the, the men who were committing these crimes actually came up through, you know, boys' homes and had a lot of trauma in their background and then it was it bore out in sort of they came through the juvenile justice system. Do you touch on that kind of stuff in the book? We do. I mean, it's absolutely true that if you 
look at most persistent or serious offenders, you'll find a pretty sad story in their childhood. That's what gets them involved in crime. And those people are still involved in crime. In fact, you know, the average age of active offenders has gone up and up. That's because young people aren't getting involved as much as they did previously. So it's absolutely true. There's a core of offenders who've had this terrible traumatic upbringing. But what happens is when people see they get away with crime, other more amateur people, people who maybe have had not such a bad upbringing but suddenly see an opportunity for making money, they climb on board. So there's always two groups of offenders. There's one group who've grown up without getting too much wrong in life and dip their toes in the water of crime and discover they can make a bit of money that way. And there's, a, there's a smaller group, more persistent group, who start offending when they're very young and continue offending until they're quite old. And it's that group that's left now. Much, most of the amateurs and the casuals have gone. And you've mentioned the heroin trade. And today it seems like heroin isn't as much of a thing as, say, ice is. But heroin was a big, big deal in Australia for a long time. I can remember back in the 90s, you know, there seemed to be a lot of heroin users around. And we hear the stories of the like Mr. Asia crime syndicate. You've got a whole chapter in the book devoted to statistics about the heroin trade and what happened. Can you talk to us a bit more about the rise and fall of the heroin trade and heroin users? Yeah, well, I mean, heroin got into Australia uh, during the Vietnam War with uh, soldiers returning from Vietnam on leave. They brought it with them and word of its existence started to spread, which of course created a market for it. And people started getting in on that market and the heroin overdose rate, which is a good measure of the use of heroin, just skyrocketed, went up dramatically between the mid-60s, accelerated in the 90s and reached a peak uh, around about 2000. And as it went up, most categories of property crime went up along with it. I mean, at that stage, it was a serious problem. You had people overdosing and dying in places like Cabramatta, King's Cross, Redfern. You had young kids selling heroin in the back streets of Redfern. It was an absolutely shocking time for young people. And the addiction was appalling. I mean, it was you're trying to score three times a day and it's costing you 30 or $40 a hit and you have to find that money somehow. So, you know, I can remember on one occasion, there were young kids standing at the top of Cleveland Street in Sydney wrenching open people's car doors as they went past to steal their bags. It was a, it was a very serious situation and, and one I think highlighted by the former Prime Minister Bob Hawke when he pointed out that even his daughter had been affected by it. So no one was expecting that to change, but it did. Around Christmas 2000, it was a sudden jump in the price of heroin and, and a big drop in its purity, and that shocked everybody. After the break, Don talks about some of the theories and the facts about why crime rates fell after 2001 in Australia. Here's crime statistics expert Don Weatherburn to tell us the reasons why crime started to fall after 2001. Well, when the heroin shortage hit, we all thought, I thought, and many others thought that that's the reason for the drop in crime because crime came down at exactly the same time as the heroin shortage hit. In fact, the initial thought was that people would commit more crime, but they didn't. Uh, Many went off into treatment, many uh, quit. And so it seemed like heroin heroin shortage was the main reason. But the heroin shortage basically leveled out after three years. So by 2004, the overdose rate wasn't dropping anymore. It had leveled out at about a third of what it was previously. But for some reason, crime kept on falling. So we started to see or kept on seeing big drops in burglary, motor vehicle theft, and robbery. Now, those things kept on going. So it was obvious there was more to it than just the heroin trade. Well, the more things that, that came into play were, first of all, the population was ageing. There were simply fewer young people in the 15 to 24-year-old age group, which is what the, you know, the prime age for committing crime. Then there were as I say, changes in the price of uh, consumer goods. A lot of the valuable goods turned out to be a lot cheaper. We also had rapid rises in average weekly earnings, so people had more money to spend. They didn't need to resort to crime. And then there was less cash. Uh, People were using credit cards more and more, so if you grab someone on the street to rob them, they wouldn't have much cash, and in some cases they had none. 
So there are all sorts of things going on. Also, the police, for example, became less corrupt and much smarter in the way they went about their work. So the clear-up rate went up, which meant that you were more likely to get caught than you were previously. So a whole lot of good fortune happened, a whole lot of things that went the right way after the heroin shortage to keep the crime rate coming down. And the last thing, believe it or not, was the COVID crisis, which, of course, meant people were stuck at home, which made it harder to do burglary. It made people less often going out to drink, which reduced the assault rate. So it's just been one string of good luck, if you like, that has pushed the crime rate down. So I'm not sure whether it'll stay down. I'm worried that it could go up next year, if not the year after. Yeah, you allude to that in the book, and it's very current because you take into account, as you said, COVID. But you talk about, you know, the last recession Australia had, like the deep recession of the 90s, and that definitely fed into the crime rate, didn't it? Well, it it did in some ways and not in others. Uh, Generally speaking, you find higher crime as the economy contracts. But it depends on whether the economy contracts when there's a market for stolen goods. And one of the things that's happening in the current economic contraction order, the one that's just over, is that there's no market for stolen goods, not very much of a market. So those who might think, well, look, I'll break into a house and steal something, have to face the fact that there's not much to steal except car keys, and there's not many opportunities to sell what you steal. That's not my big worry. My big worry is at the moment we're seeing this increase in amphetamine. And if it goes the way of heroin, it could easily increase the level of violence. Well, we hear a lot of reports about the ice epidemic, and there does seem to be quite a lot of violence involved in that. I don't know what the statistics say about it, but certainly the headlines would have you think that it's an absolute epidemic. There's violence against, you know, like key workers who are trying to help addicts. Are people using heroin as much compared to ice or is ice just cheaper and more available? Like what's the hierarchy of the kind of drug use in Australia at the moment? Okay, well, look, firstly, the situation's changed with heroin. People are still getting opioids, but they're doing it by doctor shopping. They're doing it by getting hold of pharmaceutical opioids like oxycodone and oxycontin. So they're running around from one doctor to the other trying to complain about chronic pain and get medication for it, which they can then use or sell or both. So that's the big problem there. As far as drug use is concerned, cannabis remains the major drug that people use, but most people use it on a fairly casual basis. Uh, There are very few incidents where people resort to crime to to get money to buy cannabis, although we did find evidence of that quite a few years ago with young kids who were doing it. The other worry is, the, as I said, is the methamphetamine, which is quite widely spread and growing, at least if you look at the number of people going into hospital with psychiatric disorders from methamphetamine use. But the thing is, the effects of methamphetamine on violence are being offset by a big drop in alcohol consumption. So these two drugs, alcohol and methamphetamine, both tend to make people violent in some circumstances. And one is going up, that's methamphetamine, but the other is alcohol, which is going down. People are drinking less. And the alcohol drop is much bigger than the methamphetamine increase, if that makes sense. And so you're not really seeing the effects of methamphetamine. You won't see them unless the alcohol consumption levels off. You've got a whole chapter devoted to booze and violence. It's called Men, Booze and Violence. And you are currently a professor at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. I find that fascinating that, yeah, it seems like people are drinking less. What can you say about men, booze and violence, especially in the context of, you know, the increased awareness and focus on family violence and violence against women and children. So what what can you talk to us about that? Well, there's no doubt that men are the cause of most of the crime. And there's no doubt that when men drink, they commit even more crime. They're particularly prone compared to women, but not only women, but they're particularly prone to getting violent when they drink to excess. So even though the majority of the population have a drink without resorting to violence, the more people drink, the more violence you tend to get. And the less people drink, the less violence you get, especially if it's drinking by those between the ages of about 16 and 25. You can get changes in alcohol consumption at older age groups, but it doesn't have much effect on violence because they're not the ones who are bashing people or committing assault. So that's been the big change. The domestic violence issue is quite interesting and quite distressing in the sense that 
Although there's been a big drop in non-domestic assault, although that's come down from fewer people drinking, there doesn't seem to have been any serious reduction in domestic assault. That's still a big problem. It's come down a little bit, but it certainly hasn't come down anywhere near as much as alcohol-related violence among men attacking men. And I think this is a real puzzle. I think it's everyone would have suspected that both types of violence, domestic and non-domestic, would come down together, but they don't seem to have. And I don't have a ready explanation for that. When you were working at the Bureau of Crime Statistics, what did like reporters and the public, what did they want to know about the most? What were, I guess, their biggest fears that you had to try and like, you know, help the police allay their fears or communicate in a really clear way about what was happening? What, what were the hot button topics? Well, I must say, talking to reporters, they're always disappointed if crime wasn't going up. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them were more than happy to hear of any kind of crime going up. And I think, you know, that's natural. They're there to report the news and it's not newsworthy to say nothing's changed. So far as the public at large are concerned, the number one crimes they were concerned about varied between break and enter. That was usually the number one concern. And dangerous driving, which may surprise a lot of people, but that was their second biggest concern. Beneath that, you had things like robbery, assault, malicious damage to property was often a higher one. So people tend to worry about the crimes they're most familiar with or they're most likely to experience. They weren't worried about gangs. They were much more worried about having their house broken into, their car stolen, or their letterbox or windows smashed. And that really didn't change much right through the 90s and, frankly, hasn't changed much since then. They're still the things that most people worry most about. And what about, look, we get asked a lot about different cases to cover and, look, people are very fascinated by serial killings. Now, if you just had a look, an overview of Australia at a certain period of time, I would probably say from the 60s to the 90s, you'd think that there were a lot of serial killers working in Australia. And certainly there have been some horrific cases. I mean, they're known all over the world. Did you encounter that kind of work when you were at the Bureau of Statistics? Were you looking at like homicide and in particular like multiple murders or serial killings and, you know, based on what people wanted to know about? Well, serial killings in Australia are pretty rare. Uh, You don't tend to get them like you do in the United States. In Australia, homicide has always been dominated by domestic homicide. So, you know, it makes up the single biggest subcategory of homicides. Husbands killing their wives and often their children as well very occasionally women killing their husbands and the children as well. Then the rest of the homicides tend to fall in a couple of other categories, which is sexual jealousy or jealousy motivations, which result in people being shot. The smallest category is usually organized crime killings. That that would be very small and serial killings. That would be extremely rare. So, I mean, they're fascinating. Of course, everybody finds them interesting, if not terrifying but they're certainly not the biggest crime problem facing Australia and probably not the biggest crime facing any country. They just arouse a lot more anxiety than than the more ordinary, nonetheless tragic kinds of crime. I think people generally worry about the crime they see around them, and that is so often burglary or car theft or wanton damage to property, those sorts of things. Recently, I think people have become more concerned about sexual abuse of children because they've seen so much of this at the Royal Commission coming out. But it's very hard to quantify the scale of that problem because it's a hidden problem. Uh, It's no use relying on the police figures. They don't tell you how big the problem is and it's impossible to interview young children. So it's a huge problem, but we can't say how big. And for you in your professional life and and maybe in, in your personal life too, are there any crimes or events that have really you know, stuck in your mind, like they had a real impact. You know, some people just, there's certain things that happened at a pivotal time in their life where they just remember, like for me, it was when Hoddle Street and Queen Street massacres happened, I um, was quite young and my father worked in the city. He's a jeweler. And also when the Manchester Unity Building killings happened, I was very scared because he was a jeweler in the Manchester Unity Building. So those kind of things are like burnt in my mind. Was there anything like that for you that inspired you to get into this kind of work? Well, there's certainly things that stuck in my mind about crime. One of them was when I was a student, I was a taxi driver and I drove a man to 
the Woolloomooloo Wharf and told him how much the fare cost and it wasn't that much and he just punched me. I was just stunned and he jumped out of the cab and ran off. But, you know, I was left with a black eye and, and uh, it was just so sudden and so shocking. I never know, you know, I just never really thought that could happen to me. Um, but I don't know if it turned me to crime. Then another occasion, I remember when I was still a university student and I was a victim of a housebreaking and I came home and everything was gone. Everything that mattered to me uh, was gone and that was pretty shocking. Maybe those things have an effect on you. I don't know. I just uh, think crime is an inherently interesting topic and I imagine I would have drawn, been drawn to analysing it and understanding it whatever had happened. But those are, I think everybody has experienced incidents of crime and tragedy, if not to themselves, but to the, you know, to people they know well. And I think it stays with you the rest of your life. Yeah, and even if you haven't been directly impacted by crime, I think there's that collective, you know, shock about crimes. You know, I'm thinking of Port Arthur. I mean, that, you know, shocked everyone. And, yeah. you know, the murder of, say, Anita Cobby or Janine Balding, I know that we get a lot of messages about that, where, where Australia was just shocked at the level of depravity, violence that happened in that case. So it has a very personal impact, doesn't it, crime, even if you're not directly related to it? I think the whole of Australia remembers those incidents. Before them, there were Baker and Crump. And, you know, there are these the Anita Cobby and um, Janine Balding murders. I mean, these things really do stick in people's minds. Sadly, they are, I mean, it's great they are extremely rare, but they shake the foundations of public confidence in their own safety. And I think that has a lasting effect. So it's no surprise that people are more anxious than you think they should be about crime. When you read incidents like that, they do stay with you. And I think you talk to your grandparents, they will also bring up things of a similar kind that have happened in their lifetimes and, and which have stayed with them. So, you know, it's, it's an inherent and unavoidable part of life, but it's nonetheless traumatic for that reason. And I mean, look, you know, you're talking to me for a, a true crime podcast. And as we all know, the true crime genre has kind of exploded in interest. I mean, I think that people have always been interested in true crime. It's just we didn't have as many ways to access it. Like, you know, I read a lot of true crime books. Back in the day, the newspapers would serialise court cases and that was, you know, almost like the podcasts of the day. But certainly there's a lot of interest. So what would you say to people born from your research right now? What is the absolute state of play with crime in Australia right now? Uh, well, I'd say you're a hell of a lot safer than you were back in the mid-1970s when it comes to having your home broken into, being assaulted, having your car stolen, being a victim of theft. Uh, those incidents are much, much less prevalent than they were. People find it hard to believe that, you know, when you look at the, the actual figures, for example, the, the homicide rate is 25% lower now than it was in 1973, 74 the burglary rate is 23% lower now than it was in the mid-1970s. The motor vehicle theft rate is 40% lower than it was in the mid-70s. This is per head of population. These are truly dramatic declines. So in terms of those offences, you're a lot safer. Are you safer from every kind of crime? No. Internet fraud is a huge problem. Sexual abuse on the internet is still a huge problem. But compared with the mass crimes that we all grew up with in the 70s and 80s and 90s were a heck of a lot safer. What do you attribute the drop in homicide to, the 25% drop in homicide? Oh, that's the twenty-five or $50,000 question. I wish I could understand it. There are two competing theories. One of them is that it was the buyback of firearms after the Port Arthur massacre. That's not my preferred theory. The other one is that over time, fewer people are, d are dying from their injuries. In other words, there are just as many people being attacked, but fewer people dying from their injuries because of vast improvements in emergency medical care. That's certainly been the case in the United States. And I think there's good reason to think it's at least part of the explanation in Australia. And you do touch on the fact that we're, we're in this COVID situation, the world's in turmoil. Financially, things aren't looking as good as they were a few years ago. What could be the state of play in the next few years for crime in Australia? Well, look, 
The thing about unemployment and recessions is the effect on crime isn't immediate. People don't go out and break into houses the first time they get unemployed. The way it works is that you get young people who never get a job and a year or two years down the track, they still haven't got a job. And that's when their mind t- starts to turn to other ways of raising an income. So if there's going to be an effect of COVID on crime, you're not going to see it for another year or two. You're going to get this initial drop, which we've experienced, and which will disappear the moment people go back to work and start socialising as they, they did before the epidemic. But I think the, the thing to worry about is what's going to happen two to three years out. Now, I'm not saying it's going to go up for sure, but uh, I think that would be the time to say, well, now, if we're going to see an increase in crime, this is when it's going to happen. And during the course of writing and researching this book, was there anything that really surprised you or was there anything out of left field you thought, oh, that's interesting? Uh, I found it all interesting. I think that surprised me was that I had these 16 different theories. And when I started, when we started, we were thinking, well, which one's right? But gradually, one by one, they all got knocked over. And we slowly came to realize that it's not just one factor. There's no one theory. There are different factors that work for different offenses. In the case of assault, it's the downturn after 2008 in alcohol consumption. In the case of burglary, it's both the drop in heroin use and the disappearance of the stolen goods market. In the case of robbery, it's the decline in cash use. So the big surprise was that none of these theories really captured everything. And there isn't any single theory that does. It's boring to say it, but it's a complex problem with a lot of different factors at work. Do you think that policing is harder or I'm not saying easier, I mean, I'm using that word a bit flippantly, but what's the nature of policing like for police these days with what they have to come up against, do you think, in your opinion? Well, I'd rather be a police officer now than than in the 70s, 80s and 90s for several reasons. Firstly, you've got the support of management. They are not crook. They're not on the take. The Secondly, you've got very smart tactics being put into play. Some of them are controversial, I know, such as, you know, police move on directions and searches and so on. They are controversial, but, but some of these strategies are being put into play when there's evidence to back them up as being effective. So, you know, policing's become a lot more sophisticated. Police are being held to account much more than previously. You know, if you're if you want to find out how your local area command is going, you can find out. You can say crime's going up in your area. What's the reason for this? Back in the old days, you'd have to go to a neighborhood watch meeting and the police would be in charge of the stats. These days you can find out for yourself not only what's going on in your neighborhood, but what's going on in your street. So this makes a huge difference to police accountability. So I think I'd much rather be a police officer now than to be a police officer back when, you know, you didn't know what was up and what was down. Thank you for listening to this episode of Australian True Crime, made in partnership with the ACAS Creator Network. And thanks to our guest, Don Weatherburn. You can find details about the book, The Vanishing Criminal, on our website. We'll be back next week. This has been another Smart Fella production in conjunction with the Acast Creator Network. Welcome to Acast Recommends. Every week we pick some of our favourite shows and this is one we think you're going to love. The Daily Oz is a news podcast for young people by young people. We were always the friends who got asked to explain the news. And three years later, we bring accessible, bite-sized news to over 75,000 Instagram followers each day. Now, we're delivering the news to your headphones. I'm Sam, and I'm 26. And I'm Zara, I'm 24. And we're here to make sure you're informed before you finish your morning coffee. We speak your language, and we know what matters to you. The experience of getting your head around the news should be as easy as Facebook and Netflix. We're here to provide that. Join us every weekday wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram at The Daily Oz. Subscribe to this show and hundreds more now via Acast or wherever you get your podcasts.